Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. In the last video, I was talking about some of the figures and concepts in this paper, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. About 10 years ago, Timothy Lenton and some other authors did a paper, Tipping Elements in the Climate System. And so here we are 10 years later, and in using um, you know what's happened uh, since then, um, there's this paper here, which has caused a bit of a stir in the last week. So I talked about this in detail in the last paper. Some of the key things are we were in this area of in this cycle from glacial to interglacial, back to glacial, etc. But now we've moved beyond that and we're actually heading up on this trajectory here to a hothouse earth, a much, much warmer earth uh, via abrupt climate change. So we don't know for sure where we are on this curve. We may have crossed some threshold, I think. This paper says that we're probably 10 or 20 years out from crossing a threshold, but the danger is, is that we rock it up to a much warmer world. So can we stabilize the Earth system and have this type of trajectory? Okay, so that's what this paper is really looking at and asking. Uh, this is another depiction here. Um, this is like a surface of energy. It's to think of it as uh, topography, like the hills and valleys. And if you get, if, if a ball, the Earth is rolling around in this trajectory, if it gets stuck in this deep well of hothouse earth, it, it becomes extremely difficult to get out of that state. We're committed to that state for a long period of time. So here's, so we basically went from glacial period to an interglacial period. Um, over the last uh, 1.2 million years or so, now it looks like our human emissions have pushed us further out and we're rolling down this hill and our trajectory is to this hothouse earth. So can we treat climate change as an emergency, as a global emergency, and enact earth system stewardship to try to bring us back to some sort of stable point? Okay, so that's the whole idea. And uh, there's all of these different tipping elements. So you hit them at different temperatures. Um, and we're already at risk of these yellow ones and the orange ones are with higher temperature according to these guys. I have to disagree. A lot of these things are changing already. And the uh, red ones uh, are uh, greater than five degrees Celsius. So they come in at different levels of warming, but then there's cascading effects. So you get one thing tipping and then that can lead to another thing tipping. and and so on down the chain. Okay, now there's a, there is a um, supporting information on this. Okay, so I just want to talk about some of this because this is where the numbers is. Uh, this is a very good read. So just, uh, you know, get this article. Um, if you go in this article here, um, somewhere near the, here we go, appendix. Okay, there's an appendix, just click on one of the links. I think here, here's the appendix here, and this is what we have here. So it talks about the Holocene variability and rates of change in the Anthrop Anthropocene. So I want to point out some of the, the key things. Okay, so, so the, uh, you know, the variability in the Holocene is discussed here, but I want to talk about some of the key things, the key rates of change. Okay, so we're CO2, we're already in the Holocene, the CO2 level, um, the Holocene. In the last 1.2 million years, the CO2 level has varied between about 180 and 280 parts per million. And we're now at 400 parts per million, well above the Holocene maximum and the upper, well above the upper limit of any interglacial. Okay. Um, you know, how much are we changing? The rates of change in the Anthropocene um, are enormous compared to what we've had before. The rise in global CO2 concentration since 2000 
is about 20 ppm per decade. That's about 2 ppm per year. That's uh, up to 10 times faster than any sustained rise of CO2 in the last 800,000 years. Since 1970, the global average temperature has been rising at a rate of 1.7 Celsius per century. Um, and that you need to compare that to a long-term decline over the past 7,000 years at a baseline rate of 0 0.01 degrees Celsius per century. Okay, so because of the orbital characteristics of the Earth, we should be in a cooling period, but we're swamping that with our emissions. So these human-driven changes far exceed the rates of change um, of any, anything in the past. Okay, so the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, very warm period on the Earth, 56 million years before present. The warming reached five to six degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial, lasted about 100,000 years. So there was sea level rise, ocean acidification, extinction of a lot of things. Okay, this warming was driven by a carbon release, about 1.1 gigatons of carbon per year. Okay, um, for a total of about 10,000 gigatons of carbon. What we're doing right now is we're putting carbon in the atmosphere at a 10 times faster rate. Okay, it, used to, it was this in this warming period before. Actually, we're now uh, 10 gigatons of carbon per year. If you want to convert that to gigatons of CO2, you multiply by, by 3.66. So it's you know, 36, 37 uh, gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, our cumulative emissions of carbon from 1870 through 2017, we've reached 610 gigatons of carbon. Okay, um, so we're changing things extremely rapidly. Okay, um, very all the, all the human activity has significantly altered the climate in less than a century, driving many changes within marine, freshwater, and terrestrial ecosystems on multiple processes at different levels of biological organization, okay? So species are under, under stress, okay? We've transformed 51% of Earth's land cover from forest and grassland to anthropogenic biomes of crops, cities, grazing lands, roads, etc. you name it, mostly since 1700. Current extinction rates are at least tens and probably hundreds or more times greater than background rates. Okay, so you can look at um, different, in order to try to assess what's going on, you need to look back into the Earth's path. Okay, so here's, so, so this is a good table, I'll just focus on some of the tables. So here we are right now, or this is in 2017, 400 ppm CO2, temperature one de over one degree Celsius, warmer than pre-industrial. Okay, um, we can't, this is, stability here is not possible. We're rocketing up. Okay, um, in the mid Holocene, about six to 7,000 years ago, we were at 260. Remember, we only varied from 180 to 280 uh, parts per million of CO2. Uh, global surface temperatures were 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, warmer than, pre, than um, you know, the, than, than pre-industrial baseline. Um, Okay, uh, then in the Eemian, the previous interglacial, about 125,000 years ago, we were again at, the, at that 280, 280, maybe slightly more, up to 300 parts per million. Temperatures were one to one and a half degree warmer than pre-industrial, so we're, we're, attain we're reaching close to that. Okay, uh, in the mid-Pliocene, three to four million years ago, we had CO2 levels more comparable to Today, we're touching the bottom range here at 400. Temperatures were two to three degrees warmer and sea level rise 10 to 22, me 20, 10 to 22 meters higher. Um, and this was a stabilized state, okay? So it took time for the temperature to rise up and for the sea levels to rise up in that state. Now we go back even further, um, we were four to five degrees warmer 10 to 60 meters of sea level rise. Okay, so some of the feedbacks that can accelerate the trajectory towards the hothouse earth pathway. Pathway. 
Okay, so we talked about permafrost thawing and release of... Okay, so if it's under aerobic conditions with the availability of oxygen, the organic material, the carbon in the organic material gets broke, gets, gets um, uh, decomposed by the bacteria and it produces CO2. If there's no oxygen available, it produces the methane. Um, now, it's estimated, now according to this study, you need two degrees Celsius of warming. So we're not there yet in order to estimate uh, these type of feedbacks here by 2100. So it's saying we have two degrees of warming. If we had two degrees of warming, which is a, on the low side, I mean, we'll probably pass that, you know, long before 2100 I, I, in my estimation. Um, then you have, uh, this is the strength of the feedback. So you get lots of feedback. Methane release from uh, ocean methane hydrate. It's saying, you know, you need a much warmer temperature for this to happen. And it's saying, it, see, it's discounting methane, which, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how the studies can still discount methane or say it's negligible by 2100. Okay, weakening of land and ocean physiological carbon sinks that remove CO2 from the atmosphere. I've discussed some of the mechanisms, okay? So again, at the two degrees, uh, relative weakening of sinks, um, more bacterial respiration in the ocean, releasing CO2 into the water in the ocean, Amazon forest dieback, boreal forest dieback, uh, reduction of northern hemisphere spring snow cover, so that's uh, making it darker, decreasing the albedo, so you get more absorption in the Arctic causing warming, and it's talking about how this contributes to polar amplification by a factor of two. Uh, Arctic summer sea ice loss. See, once again, they say, you know, it's fast process, but likely to have ice-free Arctic Ocean summer by 2040 to 2050. And, you know, let's see if it happens, you know, in, in a few years, by 2020, 2021, 2022. Antarctic summer sea ice loss, uh, polar ice sheet loss. Um, okay, so this is the glacier. So you can get a three to five meter sea level rise from the loss of the West Antarctic ice sheet, up to seven meters additional from loss of Greenland ice, up to 12 meters from grounded, marine grounded parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet. And of course, if you lose those, then the main ice sheets uh, also come off. Okay, um, and then it talks about the details of all these things. This is an idea of the carbon that is stored in the different biomes. Um, tropical, subtropical forests, savannas, deserts, uh, et cetera. So, temper so look at a, lots of carbon in the tropical, subtropical forests, the rainforest. Lots of carbon in the boreal forests. This is temperate, sort of mid-latitude forests. Lots of carbon in the tundra, in all of the different biomes. And this is the area of the biomes, and if you just divide the carbon by the area, you get the carbon, gigatons of carbon per, per million square kilometers, those sort of numbers. So you can see, um, you know, the, the, basically the tropical, subtropical forests, how, how high they are. Okay, so I'll just go down quickly. Um, these are critical biosphere or earth system features that support humanity. Okay, so uh, agriculture. You know, I've talked about food a lot. Food is being hit by, by the droughts right now. It's being hit by the, um, the, the, the high temperatures, heat waves, and, and the drought. So the productive agricultural regions, North America, West and Central Europe, Northeast China, Indo, uh, Gangetic Plain. Each of those regions provides food for about a billion people. And when you get the soil fertility depleting, less water, loss of coastal lands, it stresses these um, regions. The coral reefs, 10% of marine fisheries are food source for 500 million people. We're losing the reefs. Tropical rainforests, tropical drylands, low-lying deltas, uh, you know, centers of population. Two thirds of the world's megacities are less than 10 meters above sea level, and so on. Monsoons changing, mountain glaciers, etc. Um, and these are some of the things that we can do to try to stabilize the Earth system. So, it, we're in a climate emergency. Thanks for listening.